Celebrating 46 years on the air, award-winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, Russia steps out of the Black Sea grain deal and the whole world reacts. Now what? And speaking of getting goods to broader markets, in our feature, a supply chain symphony right here in the U.S. And with all that heat in the Midwest, a delicate balance, Christmas in July. And this week's Farm Week kicker. She was a hairdresser before COVID. Now she's grooming in a whole new way. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Jonah Holland. And I'm Zach Ashmore. Great to have you with us again here on Farm Week. Mike Russell is away on assignment. The war in Ukraine is nearly 18 months old. At the beginning, there was concern that the price of grain leaving Europe's breadbasket would push the price of food out of reach. A deal, a shaky one, lasted nearly the same length of time. And as you may know, all that has changed. Peter Tubbs has more. The Russian government ended its participation in the Black Sea Grain Initiative. The Kremlin threatened to fire on Black Sea shipping until its demands to get more of its agricultural products onto global markets are met. Russia had previously announced record wheat exports over the last year. The pact, which was initially agreed to in July of 2022, allowed for the export and transportation of grain from certain ports on the Black Sea while Russia's invasion of Ukraine was being fought. The deal had been extended three times over the last year. The grain exports were primarily being sold to countries in the Middle East and Africa. The United Nations, which helped to negotiate and monitor the pact, estimates that 1,000 ships successfully exited the Black Sea to 45 countries. Over 36 million tons of food commodities were exported from three Ukrainian ports during the agreement period. Corn made up half of the exports, with wheat filling another quarter of the export shipments. The accord is credited with helping to reduce soaring prices of corn, wheat, barley, and sunflower products in developing nations. As the pact expired, Russia pounded cities in southern Ukraine, including the port city of Odessa, in three different rounds of missile and drone attacks. Dozens have been wounded. Drought on the radar. In parts of Minnesota, it has left farmers dealing with a unique problem. Intense heat is sparking barn fires and putting livestock at risk. John Lauritsen reports from Melrose, Minnesota about what farmers are doing about it. We got a lot of cows having calves right now, so new life all the time. That's always great. At 3D Dairy near Melrose, farm life is fast paced. Dennis Middendorf's dairy cows rely on hay for milk production but simply storing hay bales during a hot, dry summer has become a risky venture. The heat has nowhere to go. And if you got too much hay on top of each other, it can't get out, it gets hot, gets over 170 degrees, you may get some black bales or start a fire. Farmers in southeastern Minnesota know that all too well. The Wilson Township Fire Department has responded to a record number of barn fires this year, and they've documented the destruction on their Facebook page. In almost every case, the barn and everything inside was lost. Part of the challenge for rural fire departments is finding a water source to put out hay barn fires. Oftentimes, that source can be several miles away, which is why Middendorf does all he can to keep his barns in one piece. He doesn't stack his bales too high, and he tries to keep a breeze blowing through his buildings. I think the key is keep space in your bales. Keep them low height wise, two, three high. Just another challenge during an already challenging summer. You're always got that in the back of your mind. You don't want a fire that's starting and spreads elsewhere. In related news, much of eastern Iowa hostage to a severe drought. That lack of rain certainly having an impact on crops, but the Christmas tree industry definitely out on a limb. The heat bringing more damage we could see several years down the road. Reporter Brian Tabak has more about Christmas in July. At the Cedars Edge Evergreen Market, it's never too early to start talking about Christmas. It's pretty neat to see these trees we put in that were, you know, a foot or 16 inches have actually grown to, some of them have grown up to nine foot already. Owner Mark Banowitz first opened seven years ago. 
This is the first year he's able to start selling these trees he planted himself. Seven years has flown. He says those trees are doing well despite the state being several inches short of rain. It's the 500 seedlings he planted this year he's worried about. The seedlings we're using, we're losing a lot of those. Iowa Christmas Tree Association President Bob Moulds, the owner of Wapsie Pines Tree Farm, says Banowitz isn't alone. He says many new farmers are also struggling, and there isn't insurance for crops like these. If they all die, they all die. <laughs> there's, no, there's no insurance. Moulds started changing his ways after the 2013 drought. He's watering each of the 4,000 trees he planted this year, as well as mulching each and every one of them. If we had not mulched all these trees and individually watered them three times while it was dry, they, uh, a large percent of them would not have made it. As the association's new president, Mould says he wants to show other new tree farmers like Banowitz what he's learned over the years. So they too can make it through droughts like the one we're seeing right now. You know, once they put them in the ground, um, there isn't a whole lot we can do as far as making them grow. On the lighter side, chances are you've seen one of these before. They're all over the south, especially in Mississippi, nicknamed after them way back in 1952. So it's entirely appropriate that today's Southern Gardening segment is all about this majestic blossom. Here's Eddie. There's no wonder why Mississippi is called the Magnolia State. The Southern Magnolia is an iconic symbol in Mississippi and across the Southeast. Nothing describes the Southern Magnolia better than its given scientific name, Magnolia Grandiflora. It is a beautiful classic magnolia with its large, thick, glossy leaves. The individual oblong leaves are five to eight inches long and feel leathery. The bottoms of the leaves are covered with a rusty brown fuzz. Being true to its scientific name, Magnolia grandiflora, the flowers certainly are grand. In late spring through summer, the creamy white flowers are displayed. And you certainly can't miss the up to eight inch diameter cup shaped blooms. The petals are thick and feel waxy and have a lemony fragrance. The flowers are replaced with cone-like seed pods. When the pods ripen, the large red seeds are pushed out and add to the beauty of this tree. Capable at growing at a moderate rate of 80 feet or more with a 30 to 40 foot spread, the Southern Magnolia forms a dense, dark green pyramidal shape in the landscape. If you live in the South and your landscape doesn't include a Southern Magnolia, you're missing out on one of the oldest and most beautiful blooming evergreen trees in existence. I'm Eddie Smith, and I will see you next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a short break, but stick around. Coming up on our Farm Week feature, an extended version of a story we brought you a few weeks ago. The supply chain challenges of recent years actually sparked some creative responses, resulting in new ways for goods to get from one place to another. Shipping from the coasts has always been popular, but the Great Lakes region has turned into a new favorite. We'll visit Cleveland and Duluth, where smart operators make for savvy shipping. First rate freight, coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith. I believe in my own work and in the opportunity I have to make my life useful to humanity. I believe that education is a lifelong process and the greatest university is the home. That my success as a teacher is proportional to those qualities of mind and spirit that give me welcome entrance to the homes of the families that I serve. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional.
believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith. I believed that education, of which extension work is an essential part, is basic in stimulating individual initiative, self-determination and leadership. I believe that these are the keys to democracy and that people, when given facts they understand, will act not only in their self-interest but also in the interest of society. I believe in intellectual freedom to search for and present the truth without bias and with courteous tolerance towards the views of others. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. Time for the market report. Zach's got the updates for us. That's right, Jonah. Row crops going up while livestock going down. How much did Ukraine affect that? We'll see. But first, the numbers. Last week's biggest gains and losses. What do they have to say? And then in our row report, weather the biggest story. And finally, we talk about livestock and two USDA reports on cattle and catfish. So in the markets, row crops rising while livestock going down. We'll get into the reasons, but first let's take a look. Last week's biggest gain, wheat up 36 cents, close to a five and a half percent gain. Last week's biggest loss, lean hogs down nearly 12 cents, a nearly 12 and a half percent drop. In this week's row report, we talk about rising grain prices, especially wheat. You'd think the recent Ukraine trade deal ending would be the reason, and it is a factor. But for the U.S., it has more to do with weather, at least according to Elaine Cub. You just pointed out all the, the ways that these markets have jumped up a little bit this week, but I think we could argue that it is only the weather or the weather alone could have done it. And I say that based on the lack of evidence in the cash wheat market that it has reacted in any way to this news from an export perspective. There's still extremely weak wheat basis in Texas, for instance. We are not suddenly seeing some new surge of, of exports going out of the Gulf in response to this. And it, of course, it could take some time, but I just wanted to emphasize the point that just because this is a uh, a disadvantage for Ukraine or a tragedy perhaps for folks in that in the global south that need that food, it is not necessarily being translated into an opportunity for U.S. wheat producers given the current state of our exports. I think some of that longer term forecast has been um, built into the new crop prices because that ridge is expected to proceed even into August and it is not helpful and particularly in the areas of the Corn Belt where they plant such aggressive hybrids and we're aiming for 300 bushel per acre corn and we see such really disappointing crop conditions in Illinois for instance um, less than half of the corn is rated good or excellent and any of the the yield models that the USDA or any private estimator could come up with. There's lots of pockets that are very dry and so you could have a neighbor that is 20 miles away from somebody else have completely different conditions. It's a really difficult thing for anybody to try to model the yields at this point in the growing season. So the soybeans you have both a fairly bullish yield scenario because they're facing the same stresses from the hot weather while they're blooming but you also have the continued uh, loss of acres that came in the last USDA report and I don't, I mean, I, I hesitate to, to get real bullish because I don't want to discourage farmers uh, from selling at these very profitable prices for soybeans. It's more of a, of a interesting gamble for somebody who has gambling money to do, for a speculator perhaps, or somebody who doesn't need any cash until January to probably wait to really see these bullish implications of this weather that we're seeing today really play out in the markets. It may take months for it to really be reflected. In livestock, last week the USDA released its cattle on feed report and a catfish production report that we'll look at first before cattle on feed. For U.S. catfish, water surface area down 3% from last year, food size inventory down 6%, broodfish, the parent fish, up 22%, and stockers for ponds and whatnot down 15%. In this month's cattle on feed report, cattle and calves on feed down 2% compared to this time last year. Here's what Elaine Cub has to say about it. 
Certainly the Catalan feed was more explanatory for why we have seen such strong cash cattle prices in the past couple of months. The marketings were down 5%, which is a big number. And so we did see cash cattle prices 180 on a live basis in the south and 295 dressed in the north. So they are very strong. That was a jump of 2 to $3 once again this week. So the Catalan feed report was explanatory, but going forward, the placements were again down more than folks were expecting. The cattle inventory report was showing down 3% for beef cattle. And to me, that just reminds us all that this is not just a flash in the pan. This is not 2014 where we immediately rebuild the herd and prices go away. I think these prices will be sticky because the scarcity of this cattle, this continues. This is a continuing thing that's going on according to these reports. There is a play between uh, folks going to the grocery store and choosing pork or beef, but I will clarify that actually beef prices have been softening in the, you know, in the, in the past few weeks, which is partly seasonal and perhaps a reflection of, of, of price rationing. You've got the, the choice cutout is coming down to 300, which is going to challenge packers. But packers are starting to get more for pork. So the, the pork is going the opposite direction lately. It has been continuing to, to grow since June. 115, I think the pork cutout was that this week. So that's actually fairly favorable. I don't think that we'll be able to see that in the futures market carry on much past this nearby futures contract. Once you start looking in October and onwards, there's, you know, seasonal weakness. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. Interesting week. Next one should be two. Jonah. Thanks, Zach. So you've heard of making lemonade from lemons, right? The supply chain challenge that came with the pandemic prompted shippers and shipping companies to put on their thinking caps and look for cost effective ways to move goods out of the Midwest. Turns out the Great Lakes region is the answer. Laura Weber Davis has the story. Since 2020, backups at ports in the Atlantic and Pacific coasts have left cargo ships stacked up, waiting to unload in the U.S. And rising fuel costs, congested highways, and a shortage of truck drivers are also creating headaches for businesses wanting to get their goods in or out of the U.S. interior. And they're looking for other options. Will Friedman is president and CEO of the Port of Cleveland. The companies that need to move these goods, either as a manufacturer or as a retailer, um, they're pretty desperate. And so, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And they're now asking much more so than previously, why can't we get a ship into Cleveland and just avoid all that gridlock at, at those big ports? But rerouting cargo from congested coastal ports to Cleveland isn't so simple. On the Great Lakes, freighters mainly move bulk cargoes like iron ore, grain, and coal that are loaded loose into the ship's holds. But globally, most cargo is moved in containers. Great Lakes freighters and the ports they visit aren't really set up to handle large shipments in containers, but that may be changing. In 2014, the Port of Cleveland saw an opportunity and developed the first container service on the Great Lakes to handle import and export cargo. In partnership with Dutch company Spleethof, they created the Cleveland Europe Express with a regularly scheduled route between Cleveland and Antwerp. The Peyton Lynn C, a small container ship, travels out of the St. Lawrence Seaway and across the Atlantic. The trip takes approximately 14 days, with a few days in each port to unload. And the opportunity to move other types of cargo on the Great Lakes in containers is providing new cost-effective transportation solutions for some shippers. It actually does help with cost for a ship to come all the way into Cleveland because the longer you keep cargo on the water, the more economical it is. The majority of the cost to move, let's say a flat screen TV from China to Chicago or Columbus, Ohio, is the inland transportation, the over the land transportation. Once it's on a ship, even if it's a smaller ship, doesn't have to be a mega ship, doesn't cost that much because you have those, you know, economies of scale. You, you're just pushing that ship through the water. You're not burning as much fuel. It's also more sustainable. It's also a greener form of transportation. And according to Friedman, shipping through Cleveland avoids the delays that can happen at congested ocean ports. Unlike the big ports where your container may be on a ship and it sits at anchor, you know, waiting to get to a berth for 30 days or 15 days, uh, our service is more reliable. 
In Cleveland, the cargo and containers has been mostly industrial, non-consumer goods, and exports from northern Ohio and bordering states. But on more than one occasion, they have been the answer for a business outside their region. We just had some rubber, synthetic rubber, um, moving up from Houston, uh, getting trucked all the way up here uh, to get loaded onto the Peyton and go to Europe. Um, so uh, those are the kinds of, uh, you know, somewhat uh, counterintuitive uh, moves we're seeing here with all these supply chain problems. They could not get a ship or find space on a ship out of Port of Houston, so they moved that rubber all the way up here. And Cleveland isn't the only Great Lakes port that's looking to expand its container shipping. The port of Duluth Superior is the largest port on the Great Lakes by tonnage, including the twin ports of Duluth, Minnesota and Superior, Wisconsin. And it's making waves in container shipping. Deb DeLuca is the executive director of the Duluth Seaway Port Authority. From here, you can reach major markets such as the Twin Cities, Fargo, Des Moines, also Milwaukee, and even down to Chicago. So um, it, it, from, a, from a logistics standpoint, that's very attractive. Last fall, the Port of Duluth was granted approval by U.S. Customs and Border Protection to handle shipping containers by water. And just recently, it exported its first shipment, 200 containers of kidney beans from a company in the region. They were having difficulties um, arriving at a supply chain solution with all the snarls and backups in supply chains over the past couple of years. They were not able to get their goods to market. So um, they, working with a freight forwarder, a trucking company, they were looking for an alternative solution and that ended up being sending those containers by ship through our terminal. Great Lakes ports are also looking into new options like a feeder service where containers are offloaded in bigger ports and transported along the St. Lawrence Seaway in smaller vessels, similar to what is done in Europe. Along with all the opportunities, there are many challenges to container shipping on the Great Lakes, including the locks of the St. Lawrence Seaway, which restrict the size of the ship. If you're coming into the Great Lakes from outside the system, you're limited by the dimensions of the locks. There are 15 locks that get you from sea level up to where we are, which is roughly 650 feet above sea level. And those lock dimensions are roughly mm, 750 feet long and about 75 feet wide. Uh, and the controlling depth of the water in all the channels on the Great Lakes is about 27 feet, 27 or 28 feet. So ships can't exceed those dimensions. Another factor that has been challenging for container shipping is the shortened season. Both the St. Lawrence Seaway and the Sioux Locks close during the winter. Many who use the system or ports on the system are at, like me, advocate for let's keep the system open longer. Um, we think that's feasible from a technology point of view. We, we all know, unfortunately, with climate change that we're not getting as much ice cover anymore. Winters aren't as severe. Let's allow more year-round shipping or closer to year-round shipping. Both the ports of Cleveland and Duluth expect to move more shipping containers in the coming year. Never underestimate the power of ingenuity. Well, next time on Farm Week, more mental health on the farm. We continue our farm stress theme, this time solving struggles in farm operation. We meet a couple that ask for financial advice, but it turned out there was something else lurking in the background. They got help from a group that gets hundreds of similar calls a year, and when they did, everything turned around. In the end, they expanded their operation. Relieving the pressure points next time on Farm Week. Before we go, what's that old joke about what taxidermists do for fun? You know, stuff. A hairdresser in the Phoenix area is experiencing sheer delight with her newfound taxidermy career. You might say it's become her pet project. Reporter Colleen Sikora has more. Caring for hair isn't new for Rachel Lewis. A lot of grooming. I was a hairdresser for 13 years. But the hair she's working with now is. I... I uh, do all the taxidermy work here. My husband came out and I had the can of hairspray and he's like, what are you doing with that? I'm like, it holds the hair perfectly and the ears in place. 
And so he's like, oh, I knew your hairdressing would come in use, and it really kind of has. Opening Copper State Taxidermy in Chandler about three years ago. I'm an animal lover and always have been, and I just thought there's no way I would you know, do something like that. I, I guess I just fell in love with that. It's actually an art creating something new from something dead. I'm not a hunter and I uh, have never taken an animal myself, um, but I just love kind of giving them essentially like a second life and and being able to enjoy them in another way. Creativity with being a hairdresser, you know, you look at hair patterns and um, things like that. And, and that's what a lot of the taxidermy is, is like being able to put the skin back where it should go and now bringing back nostalgia and novelty. I ended up creating a taxidermy pig piggy bank inspired by a digital art creator. The idea cured for a few years. It just kind of came into my my mind when I got the, the specimens in and I had it, you know, kind of locked away for a while. I took a casting from the pig. So this is my original like kind of prototype that I started with creating this. It's an interactive piece too. It's not, you know, just like on the shelf. While she intended to keep the one she has finished, she sold it but is working on another. The specimens come from pigs that are stillborn or die shortly after birth from local farms. I just hope that they understand that I'm not causing harm to these animals and um, that they really are loved. An art. And the people that fall in love with these pieces, like, you know, they really do cherish them. With a new life. I kind of took them on as like, what can I do with this to kind of salvage or give it a life that it didn't kind of get to have. Now that's a side hustle. Absolutely. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and YouTube. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.